Warning. Features animal cruelty as well. Let me make one thing clear. I'm a psychopath. The whole issue of diagnostics is a little bit iffy, but to cut all the crap, I don't care about people I don't know, and the concept of guilt is somewhat foreign to me. Sometimes I imagine that guilt can be described as regret, but instead of feeling regret for your own situation, you extend the regret to other people's feelings. I have come to regret actions that hurt others, but not because of the hurt itself. It was because I enjoyed the relation and my actions then brought that to an end or changed it. There are psychopaths everywhere. Estimates go from 0,5% to 5% of the population, but there is no way to know exactly. Personally I find it hard to believe that there are many workplaces with more than 20 managers that doesn't employ at least one psychopath. Few of us break character and those are the ones you are familiar with. My type, on the other hand, is a different story. We are socially intelligent, we know of the dangers of being revealed, we have far above average IQ, and no strict moral or religious code and that makes us a mystery. You wouldn't know it if you met me, and I can guarantee that no one alive knows the truth about me. Some think that being a psychopath automatically makes you a serial killer. That is not entirely true. If you add a strong sadistic personality to the above mentioned traits, you get people like Ted Bundy. People who are consumed by harming others. Despite me being a psychopath, I'm in no way a serial killer. I do recognize that we are part of the same group and I don't judge them in the same way as you do. The reason for this confession is that I wish to make it understandable to you just how much you need me and why society should come to accept my kind. Where a person like Ted Bundy is a danger to society I'm the opposite. You will benefit from having people like me around. The reason is quite simple. My goals and needs in life are similar to yours. I need you and you need me. Whereas I understand this, you emotionally normal people don't seem to understand this relationship. I therefore hope that we can come to terms with some things that and make the cooperation more smooth and this confession is instructive in making you understand how you should behave accordingly around us. Let me explain. I work as a senior manager in the food industry and I have done exceptionally well for a man of my age. I'm in my mid 30s and on my way to a new promotion. I have streamlined the company because I look through niceness and straight to the issue at hand. Does the person earn for the company or not? There are many people who create good numbers without actually doing their work properly. When you see people as meat robots and not beings worthy of care and consideration, you can easily spot ineffective workers. Where I see things clearly, your vision is probably distorted by a ton of irrelevant information concerning emotional connections. I see the pure and relevant data about employee efficiency and that is why I cut through all the usual crap. Before I got a job at my current firm, I did an MBA at a decent Midwest college. I got an internship at the company I'm employed at just before I graduated. My supervisor was a hyper guy in his 40s. He always flirted with the young interns and I could sense weakness right then and there. It didn't take long for me to understand that booze was his thing. Once I had seen him cry about his ex-wife while getting a lap dance from a Caribbean stripper, I knew my employment at the firm was certain. This particular supervisor had trouble saying no, and I tended to push him to join me for a night out quite often. In a way, that seemed friendly of course. On the weekdays I made sure to drink water every time he did double whiskers. Another thing I kept in mind was to ever so subtly turn the conversation towards something that would remind him of his ex, which would make his drinking tempo go up. It didn't take long for my supervisor's work performance to fall drastically, and I was ready to take his place. It might seem mean to exploit his weakness, but it would simply be a matter of time before he would have hit the bottle without my help. Such a slow efficiency decline is much more damaging than a drastic one. The drastic one will lead to immediate action, whereas the slow decline will drag the problems out. It can cause ineffectiveness and lead to higher prices, downsizing and other more serious problems than a single guy's employment situation. 
the company even gave him a quite decent severance agreement, so maybe I even did him a favor, who knows. The position as a supervisor was fine, but I also understood that going up from here was a challenge. I wasn't up for any promotions due to my age. The cooperate promotion system didn't work based on merit, but was based on keeping employees inside the system for as long as possible. Promoting me further would mean that people up for the same position could turn sour. In my book, that meant I had to make time pass and keep the boredom at bay. I mainly spend my time going to bars, playing poker and smoking weed. People often assumed that psychopaths have this genetic predisposition for loving cocaine, but it wasn't really for me. Marijuana however mellowed me out, and it killed the worst of my boredom, but that was the least of my worries when she arrived into my life. I had almost forgotten how to use my charm, as I had become so used to working with the least amount of effort as possible, also meaning that I had slagged on my small talk skills. This girl really woke me up from my mental slumber. I remember her name. That name still lifts my spirit when I hear it. I of course can't disclose her real name, but let's call her Lina. Lina had light brown hair, almost shining green eyes, tanned skin, a slim body and a cute smile made up of two thin reddish lips. The second I saw her I felt a strong but comfortable sting in my chest. It didn't take long before her infatuation for me became obvious. The feeling of having her eyes on me at the workplace gave me a renewed sense of meaning. It also meant my position as a powerful person in the small social circle became solidified. The interns more often sought my advice, and if I needed coffee, somebody would volunteer to bring it to me. I loved the power that Lina gave me. We had our first date a Friday after work. I asked her non-nonchalantly if she wanted to grab a bite to eat. She smiled and said sure, and I then brought her to one of the most exclusive restaurants in the city. She was flattered by my ability to seamlessly get us in. Lina didn't know that. I had spent a week working my contacts to get that reservation, and she was gullible enough to believe my little act. The whole night would have put me in a perfect light if it wasn't for one phone call. One of my managers, let's call him Daniel, called me up. I had postponed in order until Monday and squared it off with another manager. Daniel wasn't having any of it, and the whole call was him shouting at me. I had been stupid enough to take the call in front of Lina and had to try and mask my frustration. I tried to keep my act together by clenching my fist under the table, but it must have made the vein in my forehead almost pop because she started looking at it. I didn't say anything to either of course. I apologized to Lina, and despite the little incident, she went home with me that night. The word amazing wasn't enough to describe her abilities in bed. She was playful, yet aggressive. She teased me and then let me take charge and made it all seem like a game. The Saturday was ours as well. Lina then stayed with me for one more night and we just talked, laughed and had a bottle of wine. Something quite spectacular happened the next day. Since I was a kid I had always chosen my words wisely. It was like I always took a split second of thinking more before speaking than others. But with Lina the words just came to me and didn't go through the usual filter. I even opened up to her about some of my secrets. I had told her about my kitten Tom that had been living on the small farm I grew up on. He was a spotted brown stray and was always a bit moody. Sometimes he was very cuddly and other times he would attack my hand as soon as I reached for him. I told Lina that one day he had been acting cuddly and that he came to me and sat on my lap. I liked the touch and enjoyed the attention, but out of nowhere Tom scratched me and ran away. Afterwards I chased him, found him and then beat him. That's what I told Lina anyway. It wasn't the whole truth, but somehow it felt good to open up about it. We shared so many things in the days we spent together. I can't really explain what I mean by that, but it felt like we were closer and I felt comfortable around her. At the office we still flirted, but in such a way that no one noticed. Lina spent most nights at my place in the three weeks our relationship lasted. The fourth Monday Lina didn't show up for work. I called her, texted her, but no response. Something was up. 
It wouldn't take long for me to figure out where she had transferred to. There was only three places that had interns, but she was nowhere to be found. A normal human being would have thought she got hurt, but not me. Asking a bit around and acting like the reason for my inquiry was that I had outsourced some important work to her, I finally found her. She had been promoted as Daniel's assistant. Yes, the fucker that had scolded me on our first date. There was only one explanation for this, they were fucking. She had been fucking him well with me, otherwise he wouldn't have made her his assistant that fast. When I saw her from the distance, I decided not to confront her. I would spare her the public humiliation. I spent the rest of the day clinching my fists and grinding my teeth with the interns running around trying to figure out what to do. When I left the office and went to the parking lot, I saw them leaving together. While me and Lina had been fooling around, we had kept a much lower profile. Daniel had a wife and two bratty kids, but he clearly didn't care much. He was the type that you wanted to please because you knew being on his bad side could turn out really bad. He was probably just like me, a psychopath. The rage inside me when Daniel had yelled at me in front of Lina was absolutely nothing compared to the rage that was building up as I saw him prancing around with her. He was showing of a trophy for his power, a token of the fact he was better than me. Unlike me, he was an ugly overweight man and Lina wanted to rise to the top as fast as possible. She wasn't a dumb whore, she was a smart one. Next to the parking lot there was a small garage for the janitors. Unseen I quickly snuck in, took a pair of pliers, and went quickly towards my car. I followed the two as they drove to a motel in the outskirts of the city. As they arrived I parked not too far away, went hastily out the car door, and was there just in time to see what room they went into. I then left, parked my car further away, and walked back to the motel, and kept an eye on the entrance. When 3 hours had passed I went back, waited in the dark till the receptionist left, and as the door slowly closed I scooped in and grabbed the key for their room. It all happened before the older Indian lady came back. When I got to the balcony of the motel, I put my ear on the door. There was a slight snoring, and I knew Lina didn't snore, so I slipped the key in the door and I opened it ever so slightly. No reaction. I went in there and stood beside Daniel sleeping. His fat carcass was spread over the curled sheet and his arm was resting outside the mattress. The idiot was still wearing his Ralux. Lina was laying on her side facing the other way. It was now. I flexed my lats, leaned in and grabbed him around the neck pushing as much of my weight down on him while choking him. I put as much force in it from the outset so he wouldn't make too much noise. His big face started becoming bright red real fast. He hit me on the side of the head, but with very little force. I just smiled. Now I just hoped that he had fucked Lina good enough for her to be sound asleep. Daniel lost consciousness, but I kept the pressure. I could hear that Lina started moving around a bit, but I kept my focus on my fat boss. Lights out. Now it was time for Lina. I went to the other side and started to stroke her hair. She woke up. Smiled and it took her a full second to realize what was going on. As soon as the shock showed in her eyes, I grabbed her tiny little throat and squeezed. It didn't take long for life to leave her eyes and that's the moment I stopped. This one I needed unconscious. I gathered all Daniel's belongings in a bag, tied up Lina with her bra and Daniel's leather belt and left. I hastily walked to my car and drove it to the back of the motel. There was a small fire escape leading to the back of the motel. When I went into the room, Lina was still out, so I grabbed the back with Daniel's belongings and got Lina dressed. Her hands were still tied, and I made sure her coat covered it. I carried Lina in such a way that it could look like she was just drunk, but rushed down anyway and placed her on the passenger seat and drove off. There was a small area not far off the city where there was no cars, a small wooden area with a big swamp. She started showing signs of coming back from unconsciousness. I let her wake up ever so slightly. We were far enough away from the city for her to cause any kind of stir. We got out. She was still tied up, drowsy and gaining even more composure. 
I gagged her with with one of Daniel's socks. Her hands were still tied to her back. Then I placed her on her knees, slapped her and forced her to look up into my eyes. I'm sorry, I have lied to you. Remember my cat Tom? I said towering over her, while she looked up into my eyes. I was waving the plus from the janitor's garage in my hand. I didn't just beat the cat. I took the claws it had hurt me with, and then I pulled them out one by one. The look on Lina's face was just glorious. She knew what was going to happen. I placed the pliers around her one male and slowly pulled. Then I stopped pulling which made her sigh with relief. I then pulled it out in one strong jerk and enjoyed her scream muffled by the sock. I then simply finished the job by strangling her by the swamp and threw the body in the dark water. The next day I went to work like it was any other Tuesday. The other managers complimented me for keeping my composure while Daniel was reported missing. They promoted me to Daniel's position, so what do you know? The police were never able to connect the two murders, and I was only questioned once about Lina's disappearance. They had found the body a month after I had dumped it, and I didn't seem to be a real suspect after I had played the perfect helpful manager during the questioning. So the moral of the story is this, if ever you see a well-mannered guy who seems a little too self-conscious, often hides his anger and goes straight for power and influence then take care. Don't fuck with us. There is no reason to upset us. Go on with your life and then we can go on with ours.